So, super geometry. Um, let's see. So my goals today are to try to explain a few basic notions in super geometry, namely super manifold, a little bit, very little bit about supersymmetry, a super Riemann surface, and the various kinds of moduli spaces that we encounter. In subsequent talks, I will talk about more details about the moduli, the, ge the global geometry of the moduli of Riemann surfaces, super Riemann surfaces, which will hopefully connect with Deline's talks. I'll talk about several results from papers with Edward Witten, namely about the non-splitness of moduli space, about superatia classes, and maybe about the breaking of supersymmetry. And hopefully, all the talks will be connected, more or less. Uh, so Pierre is going to talk about his construction of the delin mumford compactification of supermoduli space and various items surrounding that. Witten is going to talk about integration on supermanifolds and its relation to uh, superstring perturbation theory. And Doker will talk about, I'm not exactly sure, but super, super periods and arithmetic applications. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <coughs> OK, so let's start with a supermanifold. Well, let's not start with a supermanifold. Let's start with a split supermanifold. And then we'll remove the split. So a split supermanifold is a supercommutative locally ranked space. So let's specify it by a manifold M and a sheaf, which we'll call OS. So S, the supermanifold, will be this pair, the manifold and the sheaf on it, where M is a manifold, V is going to be a vector bundle over M, and OS is the exterior algebra on V. So I think of V as the sheaf of sections of a vector bundle. So if you want, you might just tensor it with OM to be sure. And just notationally, I'm going to use the dual of V. I want V to give me tangent directions. V dual would be cotangent directions. So this is modeled on an earlier question, what is a manifold? A manifold is a topological space with a sheaf of functions, which locally looks like affine space, vector space, your, your standard example of a manifold. So this makes sense in, let's get to the categories in a second. Let me first remove the split. So a supermanifold is a gadget like this. So let's see if we understand of all the words. A locally ringed space just means a, ma a manifold, or, well, a space, topological space, with a sheaf of functions. The local ha has to do with the, the stocks at points. 
super commutative, well, for a manifold, we would want the function to be commutative. The whole point about super is that we have bosonic coordinates and fermionic coordinates. The fermionic coordinates anti-commute. So there's the usual rule of signs that says that if you have two quantities in whatever world and you want to commute them, you get a minus one in between. The minus one goes to a power, which is the degree of A times the degree of B. Not, not plus, it's times. So you think of the degree as taking values in 0 and 1, and you multiply them. In other words, if either one of them is purely even, it will commute with everything. If both of them are odd, they will anti-commute. So this is not meant to be anything mysterious. This is the same as the usual rule for commuting exterior forms. If we have, if we have a the exterior algebra on something, and we grade it by form degree, we have exactly this supercommutativity rule. OK, so what is a supermanifold without the split is a locally ringed space, locally isomorphic, as a locally ringed space, meaning as a space together with a sheaf of functions on it, to one which is split. So a few things we can assign to, the, to these gadgets are I'll try to stick with this notation fairly consistently. M is going to be the dimension of the underlying manifold M. N will be the rank of the bundle. And we say that the dimension of S is the pair M, M slash N. So M even or bosonic coordinates and N odd coordinates. So it takes a little bit of time to get, get used to this, hopefully not too much. Let me point out the obvious, which is we have various options. This was our breakfast here. Uh, we can have it. M, for example, can be ordered C infinity or holomorphic or algebraic, although we'll put a, a couple of words of caution about the algebraic case in a minute. Um, also, the ground field K can have various options since the intention of this workshop is to connect with physics. We'll work all in characteristic 0 throughout. But we could take it to be the complex numbers, or we could take it to be the real numbers. And actually, there's a third option, which is quite interesting for the physics applications, which in the institute notes from, what was it, 20 years ago? It's called CS, which stands for complex super. Complex supersymmetric, thank you. Um, which is a hybrid of these two. Uh, roughly speaking, you're taking the manifold to be real and the bundle to be complex, which makes perfect sense. You can talk about complex, not holomorphic, just complex bundles on any topological space, in particular on a real manifold. So CS is, I think, essentially that particular combination. OK, so 
let me talk for a moment about the distinction between a split supermanifold and a supermanifold. Supermanifold. So a supermanifold S determines M and V. They are part of the data. I mean, I started with an M and a V, and I built a particular S, which was the split one. Now let's say I have an arbitrary one, which is not split. I can still determine M and V from it. Namely, you look at the structure sheaf OS, and you observe that it contains a natural ideal J of all nilpotents. J is the ideal of nilpotents, which is the same as ideal generated by all the, all the odd elements. So it doesn't consist only of odd elements. That's not possible. If you have an odd element, you multiply by another odd element, you get something even. But take the ideal generated by all the odd elements. That is nilpotent because of the rule of sign. Anything that's nilpotent, well, anything that's of odd, of odd degree, you square it and you get 0. OK? So inside our structure sheaf, we have the ideal of nilpotence. And then we have it squared, and it's cubed, and so on. So we have a nested sequence. And then we can recover M, which we call S reduced. The reduced structure of the supermanifold S is the underlying manifold, with topological space together with the manifold structure. So it is defined by its structure sheaf, OM, which is OS divided by J. We kill the odd variables. We're left with the even ones. While V dual is going to be recovered as J mod J squared, which of course suggests that this is GU0 with respect to J of OS. And this is GUR1 with respect to J of OS. And we can look at GUR dot with respect to J of OS. The associated graded sheaf is the exterior algebra on V dual defined this way. So M together with this sheaf, with this graded sheaf, is a split supermanifold with same M and same V. So maybe I could try to summarize the situation. By saying that a supermanifold S determines its graded version. We'll call that GUR S. This is a supermanifold. This is a split supermanifold. This determines a manifold M in a bundle V and is determined by it. The, the split case is determined by M and V. It's just the, ex the sheaf is the exterior algebra. In S, we have possibly additional twisting data. So, so a supermanifold is a split manifold. Well, it determines a split supermanifold, but, but it in involves further Twisting, further information. So you're not uh, you're one step ahead of me. That's on the next page. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, well, why do you need the whole curve to get a super split manifold? Well, I need a sheaf. Gur 1 and Gur 0 are not enough? 
no, let's, uh, let, let's uh, not, not unless the rank of V is just, just uh, one. Uh, uh, in general, V will have rank N. So you need to go N steps before it peters out. You have N independent yeah. odd variables. You wouldn't be able to multiply. Just well, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a ring. I, I mean, he was saying, you know, just find the product of, two, of any two odd things to be zero, but that, that's the wrong thing. That's not a, an exterior algebra. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give examples in a moment. But uh, le, le, just setting up the, the language, so we often talk about coordinates. So let x1 up to xm be local coordinates in the C-infinity case or in the holomorphic case, local coordinates on a neighborhood of a point on M. And let theta1 through theta n be uh, whatever. Should I call it the basis? of V dual. Again, locally, V dual is, uh, every vector bundle is trivial, so, loc so locally I trivialize it and, and let theta be the, be the basis. And then I say that x1 through xn sla so m slash theta1 theta n are the <coughs> coordinates on S. So I have M coordinates coming back from from the, coming from the base plus plus the odd coordinates. So let's think about this for a second. Can we say that the x's are pullbacks of coordinates from the reduced manifold? Uh -uh. So we have s and we have m. The definition I gave embeds m into s, but it does not necessarily give a map going back the other way. Right. So a map between manifolds, submanifolds, ringed spaces, is given in terms of a map forward on the topology, and a map backwards, a pullback on functions on the sheaves. Right? So uh, well, yeah. So if the manifold is split, then I have a projection this way. But in general, I don't have that. All I have is the inclusion. So since I don't usually have a projection, I cannot say that the x's are coordinates on the on the reduced space and I, and just pull them back. Rather, there's some choice involved in actually choosing the coordinates on the supermanifold. To say on GER S at the end of the, at the end of that panel, it's on GER S. Well, yeah. If the x's are on the base, the, then the pullback makes sense on GER S. On a, on a general S, which is not split, you, 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 this is an additional data. So, so co the coordinates would be co co functions on S, which are even, whose restriction to M gives you a, a system of local coordinates on M, yeah. together with the thetas that are a basis for the odd coordinates. I was just puzzled when you said theta 1 to theta n is a basis for V dual. You have written the coordinates on GER S rather than on S. Well, but, oh, but I think they're functions in S. They yeah. happen to project. They happen to be in the ideal, and they project isomorphically onto that quotient. It's project those bases on that quotient. Every supermanifold is, by definition, locally split. That's right. Coordinates are things that are local. So you choose a splitting. You talk about the coordinates. Okay. Okay, so you've chosen a splitting, and then you choose. Okay. If V is trivial globally, yes. 
Does it mean that we have global odd coordinates? That's the, well, if, 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 if v is, is bundle is globally trivial. V is trivial. Then I think I still need to assume that S is split. Not sure. I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure offhand if, if, if I need S to be split. But if, if yeah, if both of, the, of those are the case, then you have global odd coordinates. Okay. <laughs> Please keep the questions coming. Okay. So, are there any supermanifolds? <laughs> it's not good to build a theory of the empty set. So the most obvious example is affine space of dimension m slash n. That is the case where everything is global. So m, in that case, the manifold is m-dimensional affine space. v is direct sum of n copies of the structure sheaf. And so is V dual. And uh, AMN is just the obvious. So you have a global coordinate rings, which let's use complex notation. So it'll be C of Z, X1 through XM slash theta1, theta n, where the theta is anti commute, the X is commute. We have this one global ring. It's Z graded, in particular. You reduce mod 2, you have a Z2 grading. And it gives you global functions on this manifold. So if I talk, it doesn't do any good. You should do some of the work. So exercise, construct projective space of dimension mn. So for the usual projective space, the case that n is 0, there are two distinct constructions. One is as a union, i going from something to something of open sets ui, and the other as a quotient by x, lambda, x is equivalent to x lambda lambda as a scalar. OK, so let's just think a little bit about what's involved in each of these, and I'll let you fill in the details. Um, how many UIs do we need? M or N or M plus N plus 1? M plus 1. So I goes from 0 to M, just as in the even case. We do not add more open sets for the odd coordinate. A general rule that you might want to remember is odd coordinates, odd variables, have nothing to do with the topology. They give you fluff, you know, potent directions. But they don't change the topology. So the topology of this projective space will be the same as the projective space itself. The underlying reduced manifold will be PM. So the topology given by this cover involves m plus 1 open sets. And then you need to, to, to specify the identifications. And again, an, an, a useful rule of thumb to keep in mind is never try to invert an odd variable. That's going to get you in trouble. Right? It's important because we, are, we have to write down the equivalence between two open sets, and that's going to involve dividing by some variables. Make sure you never attempt to divide by an odd variable. It's not going to work. Uh, the other possibility involves starting with some affine space. Presumably, it's going to be m plus 1 slash n. Does that seem intuitive enough? Or should it be m plus 1 slash n plus 1? We don't want to divide by odd variables. That's why it's not n plus 1. It's n. We're only dividing 
Right, so we're going to divide by C star, okay, I would call it GM. And we need to subtract something from that to make the division possible. What do we need to subtract? In the bosonic case, we just subtract the origin. So what do we subtract here? It's going to be A0 A slash N. So being invertible means the bos one of the bosonic coordinates is non-zero. Having a non-zero odd coordinate isn't good enough. OK, so why don't you try to fill this in, write down the definition of the proper way to identify the UIs and, and the, the quotient action, and make sure you, you see the global isomorphism between these two, and you're halfway to being a super expert. OK, so here's one example. Here's another example. And now we can do, get a lot of more examples. We can look at submanifolds. So you start with affine or projective space, and you write down an equation. Well, you want to be a little careful. You want to make sure your equation is either purely even or purely odd. And that's going to give you a sub something. Well, if your equation sat is somehow non-degenerate, if it satisfies some Jacobian criterion, you expect it to be a submanifold. What do you get if it is possibly degenerate? Well, as Dave asked, it's time to introduce super schemes. So So start with a ring R, which is Z2 graded. So this is Z2 graded supercommutative. Supercommutative means it satisfies the rule of signs as, as dictated by differential forms. Let's say R is finitely generated, finitely prese presented. So it's something like C bracket, a bunch of x's, and a bunch of thetas, modulo some ideal. Then I want to get spec R. to be a, an affine super scheme. So you want to define it as a topological space with a sheaf of functions. The fact that this ring is not quite commutative, but super commutative, doesn't really make things too terribly bad. You can still localize, inv invert, uh, talk about functions on the risky open subsets, and so on. And then you can define a super scheme, which is something, so a super scheme is a locally ring space, which is locally of this form, locally an affine super scheme. Affine super scheme just means back R for some R? Yes. It doesn't mean Let's say super space. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the terminology in algebraic geometry is a bit discordant with other terminologies. This is affine as in an affine variety, not as an affine space. OK. 
So in particular, this, this is the right notion to use when your ideal is, let's say, a principal ideal generated by one equation, but the function that generates it does not satisfy the Jacobian criterion. So instead of defining a submanifold, it defines a subspace of some sort, or in general, a subscheme. Um, what can you tell me about spec R naught? I is a homogeneous idea. Thank you. It's an affine scheme, exactly. What does it look like? What is its relation to the reduced scheme? Was well, it point set or is it? <laughs> so, <coughs> spec R naught is an ordinary scheme spec R naught reduced is spec R reduced but um, but it's very different, usually, from spec R0. R0 has a lot of nil potents in it. Right? So let's just do the, case, the basic case of the actual affine space, as opposed to a general affine scheme. So let's say R is C bracket x1, xm, theta1, theta n. Right? Then R naught contains things like a function of x times the product theta 1, well, theta i1, which theta i 2k, the product of any 2k of the odd variables, is going to have even grading. So all of these things go into R naught, and things with an, even, with an odd number of thetas go into R1. But you see that R naught is not the same as what you get by killing the nil potents, which will have only the case that k is zero. So you could think of an affine scheme as a scheme together with a coherent sheaf on it coming from R1, together with a bilinear form from R1 cross R1 going back to R0. But that underlying scheme is, not the na is, 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 is very far from being a manifold. Or you can think of it as a, as a reduced scheme together with nil potents. But these nil potents do not need to be, locally, uh, to, to be locally free anymore. And in fact, perhaps even today, we'll see examples where. So there's some, there's some intermediate case, right? I mean, you had your ideal J. Yes. And I suppose the way you want to define it, in this case, is generated by the odd uh, part, generated by R1. Uh, J squared, I guess. But then the underlying scheme might have itself had no problems before you ever introduced theta. Right? That's right. So maybe this is time for a show and tell. Um, where did I leave my... Thank you. So if you want standard references, uh, this book by Manin, uh, is that visible gauge field theory and complex geometry? has a nice fat chapter on super algebra, where he works out the consequences of the rule of sign, followed by a, a nice chapter on super manifolds, where he works out a number of rather non-trivial things about super manifolds. Quite readable and highly recommended. Um, I am going to mention in a moment uh, supersymmetry, which is a different story. And for that, I would recommend this little booklet by Dan Fried, who is somewhere in the audience. <laughs> yeah. uh, five lectures on supersymmetry, beautifully written, highly recommended. 
so I'm sorry. And the reason that I wanted to refer to Manin was because he talks, he has two distinct notations. He has S sub RED and S sub RD. And if you can remember which is which, more power to you, I can never remember. One of them is the one that I call reduce, and the other one is he kills everything that is nilpotent, including, the, including even the green nilpotent. I, when I made that definition, I was talking about a supermanifold where the two notions are equivalent. Right. On a super scheme, you do indeed need to distinguish them. Any other questions? I mean, if you want to see the details about RD versus RED, money in me. <laughs> OK. So so why do we care about super schemes? Well, if you're an algebraic geometer, you probably don't need an answer to that. If you're not, you probably do. One answer is that every supermanifold, algebraic supermanifold, has a natural stratification by super schemes, super sub schemes, sub super schemes, whatever, that are highly non reduced. And that they're God given in any supermanifold. I'll show the, I'll show it to you in a moment. So, so they really are useful, even if your ultimate address is only in supermanifold. Uh, the second reason, more pertinent to this workshop, is when we try to compactify the moduli space of superhuman surfaces, we run into these things. So you could come up with some ad hoc definitions, just extending the notion of a superhuman surface a bit, but it makes more sense to just have the the general notion available. OK. So let me just say a few words about obstruction theory. And I'll probably come back to that in the fourth lecture. And what I'll say today is taken straight out of Manning's book. So we have a, man a super manifold S. And we have M, which is S reduced. I can interpret that as the zeroth step in a filtration. So it goes to S1, S2, and so on, and stops at Sn, which is the full S. So remember, we agreed that the reduced structure is a sub, and usually not a quotient, of S. There's a natural way of filtering that, where Si is defined to be the manifold M that is common throughout with the sheaf, which is OS divided by J to the power I plus 1. So you keep up to I odd variables and no more. You kill I plus 1. OK? So when I equals 0 or I equals N, you get supermanifolds of dimension m slash 0 or m slash n. For all other i, you get a super scheme, which is everywhere non-reduced. It does not look like a supermanifold. A supermanifold would have to be an exterior algebra. Here, it's a truncated uh, exterior algebra, it's just a different animal. So one way to try to think about that box in the upper left, in other words, how much more data is there in a super manifold than in the, the split supermanifold is to consider this filtration and try to ask, well, S0 doesn't have any more information in it than M. S1 is exactly equivalent to knowing M and V. We defined V 
was on this blackboard a few minutes ago. We define V as GER1. So you get it from this piece. Okay? So then you can go to the next piece, S2, and ask, is S2 the same as the second order neighborhood inside something that is split? And if so, go to the next one, the next one. So you see the, the elements of an obstruction theory coming in. Manin writes down some cohomology classes that, assuming that at the given step you already have trivialized it, it measures the obstruction to trivializing at the next step. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a messy theory, so let me not get into it at this point. I'll come back and say a little more at a later talk. But let me mention a few elementary results which you could derive from this obstruction theory, or you could get at least some of them directly from the elementary definitions. So these are corollaries of a theory that I haven't shown you. Any C infinity manifold is split. So the the story is given any any manifold any supermanifold, you have this filtration. And there is some obstruction theory. There are some classes you can write down. There are cohomology classes valued in some bundle that you make out of your structure sheaf. And at each step, you can trivialize the next one if and only if some cohomology class vanishes. If your sheaves are C infinity, C infinity sheaves are fine, whatever they have no higher cohomology. All the obstructions that you get live in, they're actually all H1s of, of various things. So they all vanish. A C infinity manifold is trivially trivial, well, trivially split. So in talking about non-split supermanifolds, you pretty much place yourself in the context of algebraic geometry. So if the dimension of S is m slash 1, S is split. Yeah, Or it's infinity, but <laughs> we're already covered that. Uh, the reason is that the obstructions live. Let me, let me tell you what, where the obstructions live. Omega i lives in H1 on the manifold of something like the tangent bundle to the manifold, so that's the even part. And the wedge i plus 1 v dual even part, so, something like that. Anyway, it lives in cohomology of some vector bundle on the manifold. In this case, it's a C infinity vector bundle, so it has no, cohom no higher cohomology. In this case, the wedge is going to involve, it's, it's going to start with wedge 2. So wedge 2 of a, one, of a rank 1 vector bundle vanishes. So the sheaf itself is zero. But I also say that we have S1. We had already said that S1 just has the information of B. It's even more obvious why, why it is split. Um, 
when the dimension is 2, when the odd dimension is 2, there's this first class. I need to fix the notation. This is a notation that Manning chose. I think I'm just going to make that an i. So I'm, I'm redefining what I mean by omega i. So, so this is going to start with i equals 2. The, 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 so we already said that the zeroth and first pieces always come from a split thing. So the, f the first interesting obstruction is, it has to do with S2. And then S is equivalent, so I'm modifying my table above, to the, ma the reduced manifold M and the bundle V and the single class omega, or omega 2, in H1 on M of Tm tends to wedge 2 VQL. So S is equivalent to this triple of data. So what am I saying? I'm saying to any S you can assign such an omega. S is split if and only if this obstruction class vanishes. For every obstruction class, there is such an S. So it shows you, in particular, that the world of supermanifolds is much larger than the world of split supermanifolds. So in particular, you can now do your second homework problem. Start with complex projective 2 slash 2. So this is the object you built in your previous exercise. So it has coordinates x0, x1, x2 slash theta 1, theta 2. Is that the obstruction to project it or to split? In this particular case, they're equivalent. So I haven't in introduced the notion of being projected. It's, it's something weaker. You have the tangent bundles. But you don't have the derivations of the. Oh, I'm sorry. When I wrote the even part, the, the, the thing was, yeah. Ts is a sheaf on M. Right. Let me just on this. Well, it's a sheaf on M, but you want to restrict it to M. In the sense of differential geometry. Okay. Oh, no, well, sorry. That's not exactly the right thing, though. Sorry. Close. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me not try to get it straight, because I probably won't, won't get it straight. Um, there are. Even classes and odd classes, the, the even ones alone classify being projected. The even ones and the odd ones classify being split, but the, the, there's some mismatch between them. I'll try to get, uh, I'll try to, to, to get a, a more precise yeah. statement when I actually need it. Right now, for, for the first non-trivial case, which is when the odd case is two, when the odd rank is two, Oh. Being projected is equivalent to being split, and all the notions are, uh, <laughs> agree with each other. Yeah. The starting S, is it a super manifold or it could be a super scheme? I was thinking of a super manifold. Um, uh, surely there is a parallel theory, but I haven't uh, thought about it. It can be more complicated, I think, because here everything locally is the same. What we the local story is 
empty and uh, then it just to a model the world with a solution to look at the locals. I think the consensus is we'll, we'll keep it a super manifold for, for these statements. So the exercise is <laughs> instead of x0, x1, x2, why don't we change names to x, y, and z? Let's write down a conic in here. Conic looks like x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Well, we don't want to do theta 1 squared and theta 2 squared, but we can do plus theta 1, theta 2. So if we don't add this term, then we have a degenerate conic. The conic is given by some matrix. The matrix is symmetric in the, great, in the super sense. But it will be degenerate unless you include all the variables. So this looks like a non-degenerate conic. In fact, it's the only one up to isomorphisms. Uh, show that it's a sub-super manifold. I'm going to stop saying sub-super, I'll just say sub manifold. It is sub manifold of dimension. Well, we started with dimension 2, 2. We imposed one even relation. So we reduce the even dimension by 1. So we'll have dimension 1 slash 2. It's a sub manifold of this dimension. This is the first case where we have a chance of getting non-split supermanifold. It is non-split. So if you play with it, if you try to trivialize it, it will lead you to write down a cohomology class on the conic. And you'll see that that cohomology class is non-zero. That cohomology class that you discover will be exactly that omega. The degenerate conic without the theta 1, theta 2 term is actually smooth. Because if you look for where it should be, that would be when x, y, and z are 0, which isn't allowed. So the degenerate conic is actually smooth and also split. It's split because you can consistently forget theta 1 and theta 2. Right. So the other one is degenerate, is also smooth, but it's split. Thank you. So well, in this case, the obstruction is an element of some vector space. So I can add the obstructions. Does it correspond to some geometric operation on supermanifold? I would expect so for the first class. Yeah. The general, in general, the general thing about the higher classes is their trouble. I, I just. I've never been able to, to, to come up with a really satisfying theory of, of anything other than the first class. Do, do you know an operation? Yeah. I think I can answer. It could clarify. It's uh, about vector fields. But not this abstraction. It could be something a little bit different. It will not be You need to know what it is to come up with. Yeah, go, go ahead. Ah, actually, I told already. I explained already. I'm not sure everybody. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure everybody heard it. Yeah, it's, it's about vector fields. Then vector fields have another abstraction. This is exactly yours. But uh, you can uh, keep, um, take a slightly different abstraction. This is exactly vector field. So I can tell more. But I think it's more. So you're saying there is a way to rephrase this abstraction as an element of some vector field. Not this abstraction, but you can take another abstraction. Yeah, this one will be. Will come from this in other abstraction. So, and this will be exactly what it feels here. All right. Let me uh, try to wind this down. I, I want to at least introduce the, uh, the, the other important objects in the story. And I am running a little behind. So the super manifolds and the super symmetry. Symmetry 
is the action of a group. I guess supersymmetry is the action of a supergroup. Hopefully, we will hear in your talk about superly groups and the superly algebras. So let me not say anything about that. Uh, again, I can refer to a very readable book by Dan Fried where he talks about supersymmetric theories, supersymmetric manifolds. How do those fit in the context of a supermanifold? A supersymmetric manifold is a particular kind of a supermanifold where the vector bundle V is not arbitrary. It is related to the tangent bundle. Namely, it is a spinner bundle over the tangent bundle. So you need to choose a spin structure on your underlying manifold. That means a lift of the structure group of the tangent bundle from the orthogonal group to the spin group. Then there's the asso associated to that through the, let's say, half spin representations, you get spin or bundles. And roughly speaking, a supersymmetric manifold is a supermanifold whose odd directions are one or several copies of the spin or bundle. In particular, the dimensions are highly constrained. The rank of the odd, the odd dimension n has to be a multiple of 2 to some appropriate power, 2 to the m over 2, something like that. So th these are very highly constrained objects and very beautiful objects. And we're not really going to talk much about them in this course except in, in, in this workshop, except in the one-dimensional case. So a super Riemann surface is essentially a one-dimensional supersymmetric manifold. So formally, a super Riemann surface is we'll definitely take it to be complex supermanifold of dimension one slash one. So one even, one odd. One is the spinner representation dimension for one dimension. Together with a maximally non-integrable odd distribution. The tangent bundle to such an S is a vector bundle of rank 1 slash 1. Locally generated by ddx and dd theta, each of them multiplied by an arbitrary even or odd function. A distribution in differential geometry is a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle. So I'll keep the same notation. So when I, when I say uh, distribution, I mean a subbundle of the tangent bundle. When I say that it's an odd distribution, I mean that this is a, a bundle, a vector bundle of rank 1, 1. This is a vector bundle of rank 0, 1. It's purely odd. Okay. So in fact, we can think of this as a short exact sequence. So there's some quotient Q, which will be of rank 1 bracket 0. Integrability, as in Darboux's theorem, has to do with if you have a distribution, you take two vectors in it. You, right, you, integrability says that you want your two, your two vectors to commute, meaning the bracket should be 0. In this case, these being odd vectors, the natural thing to do is to look at the anti-commutator, which, which is the same as the square, or twice the square. So being integrable says that the square of any 
vector field in the distribution should be 0 in Q. <laughs> Maximally non-integrable says that the, <coughs> the squaring map, give, or, the, or the commutator map, to Q is an isomorphism. So you're squaring, you're taking two odd directions, squaring them, getting an even direction. So in local coordinates, you can always find coordinates x slash theta such that this distribution is generated by something like, well, what are the possibilities for an odd, for an odd vector field? You could have dd theta. You could have ddx, but then it has to get multiplied by something odd. And the most obvious thing to take is theta. So dd theta plus theta ddx is an example of such a vector field. If I had only one of the two terms, you would square it and you'd get 0. Having both of them means that when you square them, you get a cross term, which gives you ddx. So that gives you the isomorphism. And in fact, you can prove a lemma that says that for any superhuman surface, whenever you have a maximally non-degenerate, non-integrable distribution, you can always find local coordinates, local holomorphic coordinates in which this is the picture. So the notation is this vector bundle V that we get. It's a supermanifold. There's some vector bundle V of odd directions. We will denote it as the square root of the tangent bundle of the underlying manifold. Well, D itself will be isomorphic to this V. And this condition tells you that the square is going to, to, to give you the tangent bundle. So unfortunately, I'm out of time. I better stop now. I wanted to also tell you about moduli spaces and their compactifications, but I guess I'll. Sorry, I should organize it. Well, we do have a little more time. When is the next lecture supposed to be? Can you recall? It's a 1030, but I thought it's a bad way to, a, a bad precedent to set. Yes. If you'd like me to go on for a few minutes, it's a Well, if a few minutes would make a difference, yes, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't realize we were resuming the topic. That's fine. Well, use your judgment on whether you continue for a couple more minutes, but I, I thought we were starting a lot more. Okay. Uh, but there is no coffee, so there's really not a whole lot to do in that. Well, I think the coffee comes out. Uh, <laughs> he does? Yes. In that case, I'm definitely done. <laughs>